Hi everyone and welcome to today's Kubler online meetup. I'm Terry Shea and today we'll be discussing Kubernetes in highly restricted environments. Our speaker today is Oleg Adamanenko, team lead and architect at Kubler. Oleg's been working with Kubernetes since its release in 2015 and he's part of the team who built Kubler, an enterprise ready container management platform. You can see on screen uh, Oleg's Twitter address, which is real, you know, at real underscore Adam Anenko. And we also have one at Kubler. So if you like what you hear, please tweet us. Um, before I hand it over to Oleg, I'd like to give you a, a high level overview of the Kubler platform. Kubler adds operations and security and governance capabilities on top of open source Kubernetes. It enables IT teams to deploy, run, and manage Kubernetes clusters on-premise or in multiple cloud environments. And it builds in things like automatic logging and monitoring that's centralized across all your environments. So at a glance, you can see the health and status of your Kubernetes clusters wherever they're running. It has an API and custom cluster configuration capabilities for advanced use cases, but it also has a very intuitive user interface that makes it so easy to set up and deploy Kubernetes clusters that I demo it myself. All right. Over to you, Oleg. Thank you, Terry, for introduction. And now let's uh, move to the actual uh, part of the webinar. So you want to create a Kubernetes cluster for running your shiny application in production. How fast can you do it? There are a lot of options available. Some are open source tools like COPS, KubeADM, other are proprietary tools. Let's use, one of the, uh, let's use one of those to create a cluster. We take COPS, run it. Are we done? And the answer is no. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. And almost always the answer to the question would be never. And this is why I want to talk with you more about uh, what we need to do in order to create a production-grade Kubernetes cluster that will work uh, on, in your specific environment. So what we will discuss today uh, first, we will speak about requirements, both functional and non-functional. We will speak about uh, managed solutions and their limitations. Uh, we will speak about cross-team responsibilities. Uh, and also, we will speak about on-premises struggles, and then we will outline what, uh, where should we move next. So let's start from our requirements. Uh, before we do any work, we usually clarify our goals and expected outcome. So we have at least the following requirements. Security, we want our cluster to be as secure as possible, both from external and internal perspectives. This includes broad set of additional requirements that we will discuss shortly. Next section is audit. Uh, we want to know who did what and when. This is a crucial step for larger organizations that must be done before we move anything to production. Log collection, observability, and monitoring. We don't want to just start our apps. We also want to know how they are behaving in production so that we can be alerted and take actions on them. Do we meet our SLA? What are our SLOs and SLIs? Just having cluster is not enough. We also want to have insights on what's happening on what's happening in production. Another interesting requirement comes from financial and highly regulated organizations. Support for environments that are not connected to the global internet requires additional efforts to be put in. We need a way to deliver required Docker images and binaries to our environment before we can proceed. Even more, our installation method should allow modifying Docker images Docker image registries in our manifests, add-ons, and other deployment files. So you want to provision a cluster. The single step will be split into several steps. Each uh, step can be huge for organization if uh, it is not ready. For example, first you will need to uh, download all Docker images, binaries, Helm charts, additional Kubernetes manifests that will be required. So then these artifacts need to be moved to your existing Docker registry like Nexus, official Docker registry, Harbor, or other commercial offerings. And uh, also the same applies for binary wrapper. But what will you do if you don't have uh, those available yet in your organization? 
you need to install those in your environment and it will be additional software your uh, site reliability engineering team or DevOps team have to maintain. And another area is that you also want to play nice with the existing tooling that is already available in your organization. So at the very least, installation method you use should allow you to do automation in order to integrate with your existing tooling. Security has very broad surface area. At the very least, you want to integrate with uh, Lab or Active Directory to allow existing users to interact with uh, the cluster you create. Manual account management is usually a way to disaster, especially in the larger organizations. More often, you already have a single sign-on in your organization, so you need a simple way to integrate your solution, your cluster with existing solution using OpenID Connect or SAML. Next problem that should be solved is to properly determine your requirements for role-based access control both within your cluster and to, or to your other dashboards. Usually it requires custom development if you would like to provide a self-service for your users. Each cluster also comes with ad additional sensitive data like SSH private keys for provisioning if you're on-prem, public cloud accounts, certificates for TLS and authentication, and the question remains open how do you will you store this data at rest and make sure this information is accessed only by those who should have access to it. Without audit support, you may not use your cluster in production. It may be okay for your QA and staging environments, but in production it is a big no-no, especially if you store, process, and transmit sensitive data like financial transactions, health data, and other private and sensitive data. Also, audit support is required for your logging and monitoring dashboards, and audit support required in in a tool that you use for cluster provisioning. Uh, so you can uh, be alerted if something wrong has happened during cluster update or upgrade or if cluster becomes deleted. So now we defined how our cluster looks like. So now let's speak about our applications. From the operation perspective, the basic way to know that everything is okay is that our applications write in log file files or expose some metrics to that, are, that will be collected Sometimes you have existing tools that should be integrated with the cluster. Sometimes you will start from scratch. In any case, your approach should be consistent across your teams in the organization and provide easy-to-use solution for everyone. Even more, the set of tools you choose should have proper access control configured. Usually it's done per team, per project, and per environment. And another nice-to-have requirement is that it also should provide you a self-service. Monitoring allows us at glance understand if everything is okay with the production or not. If something is, is not okay, responsible teams should be alerted. It may be email for preventive alerts, like in five days you may be out of disk space. Maybe a Slack channel, like there is an increased error rate for some non-critical system in the product. Or it may be a page duty uh, call for critical production issues. Additional challenge is how to distinguish infrastructure and application uh, issues. So for example, if your application responds slowly, is this because of the infrastructure failure or because latest application update has a bug in it? You want to know uh, who do you are going to call if something is not correct. And as a result, it means that just creating a cluster is not enough. Installing Kubernetes requires additional components to be available in your environment. And those are Docker registry, binary repository, uh, also may be required to provide additional binaries agents on your hosts, and you also need access to your operating system package repository to install packages kubelet and Kubernetes requires in order to work on a host. After cluster is created, you may need to install additional software. For example, service mesh like Istio, and the question that you will ask, how would you get those images available in your environment?
Support for existing tooling is another area uh, of focus that should be covered when you decide to introduce new tool under your belt. How will it play with your existing tools? If, you're con if you use configuration management tools, will it support the tool you decided to use for your Kubernetes or you need to spend additional efforts in order to integrate? Now we quickly outline our functional requirements. So if we met them, uh, like what should we do next? So what are our options? So first of all, we may use managed Kubernetes offering from public cloud providers. N uh, next option is to use homegrown solution. And another option is to use third party uh, vendor or vendors, depending on the complexity of your installation. Managed solutions. Um, it is a very good way to start and prototype, but it imposes restrictions that may not be suitable to you. So for example, it may not meet your requirements or regulations imposed on your organization. In most cases, you don't have access to master nodes or you don't have access to the logs from master, so we won't be able to get uh, logs from API server. In most cases, there is no or very limited capability to customize configuration of various Kubernetes components like API server, etcd, like you don't have uh, control to modify feature flags if you need to or customize the configuration to you. And in most cases, there is no support for on-prem installation from public cloud offerings. So if you are in a data center, then manage a solution in a public cloud is not what you are seeking for. Homegrown solution definitely will cover your needs. The question you need to answer is that if you'd like to spend time and effort uh, for your own solution or you can spend it on innovation for your product. And with four major releases per year, it's really hard to keep up with upstream Kubernetes and make your solution align with what's happening in upstream Kubernetes. Having a contract with a Kubernetes partner will simplify life for you. First of all, it will cover most of your needs. Be prepared that custom development still may be required to meet your specific requirements, so choose wisely. You may require additional professional services from your vendor to integrate with your existing systems and processes, and again, custom development may be required from both sides, both from your vendor and uh, from you. So choose wisely. In large organizations, there is a separation of responsibilities between different teams. And usually there is a team responsible for compute instances, another team responsible for network and traffic ingestion, team responsible for storage, team responsible for security. Once we move everything to Kubernetes, this team must communicate effectively with each other in order to support your production. And it may, means, uh, it may mean that you need to change uh, how your teams interact with each other so that you can effectively support your production. Now let's speak specifically about issues that we may face in on-premise installations. So first of all, if you have a pure bare metal, which is like just a bunch of servers, and you don't have any automation around, so it will be hard for you to scale your clusters or create a new ones. If you use vSphere, like VMware vSphere, it is better, but the question is how to do properly self-service. Can you use a provision virtual machines themselves? What about networking and storage? If separate team is responsible, then it means uh, amount of time it, it will increase the amount of time you need in order to modify cluster topology or create a new cluster. How will you do high availability of your cluster? So you have to care about your data center uh, much more comparing to public cloud. So you need to make your data center red highly available. And it means you have to provide redundant power, uh, redundant network connectivity, cooling. Maybe you'll have several data centers. 
For disaster recovery, you need to outline your strategy. How will you meet your SLAs that are set either by your customers or your upper management? From operations perspective, there is another set of questions that should be solved. So how will you do operating system updates, operating system upgrades? How will you update operating system with security patches? How will you do Kubernetes upgrades and its components upgrades? In a cloud, it is done much more easier. Just treat your nodes in cluster as a cattle, not as pets, and be ready that they will be replaced at any given moment in time. And <coughs> if you have isolated environment, which means your environment is not connected to the public internet, like of, often called like offline mode, it means that you need to provide a way to deliver required packages. And to cover this scenario, a tool of choice that you use for cluster provisioning should support this scenario. The next thing to solve is to follow best practices for security. And those are utilize uh, role-based access control, utilize SE Linux and SecComp, utilize spot security policy in Kubernetes, uh, use network policies with your overlay network provider, and use admission webhooks so that you can limit, limit images that, are, that will be scheduled on your cluster. After we're done next, what are our next steps to do? Um, first of all, we need to strive to use infrastructure as a code Immutable infrastructure, CI CD for infrastructure, and GitOps. So, infrastructure as a code means that we will declare our infrastructure as a code uh, so that we can easily rerun scripts to reproduce our infrastructure or make copy of it. So, this will allow us to store our scripts, for example, uh, for deployment for infrastructure deployment in a source code repository so that it, we can track history changes and modify it in a way that developers usually modify their code. Next step will be to introduce immutable infrastructure. And what it means is that instead of doing uh, in, in place updates of virtual machines, you'll just replace a virtual machine with a new version of base image. It allows uh, to solve configuration drift, which often happens if you use configuration management systems. So for example, let's say you utilize, use Ubuntu 16.04 image to provision your infrastructure. Over the time, 16.04 uh, image is updated with new security versions. And it means if you run the same script at a different time, you may get different results. In order to fix uh, those, it's better to uh, track down exact versions of the packages and uh, operating system images that you use, and your updates should be just replacing with a specific version of new server. Continuous integration, continuous delivery for infrastructure. So what it means? It means that you don't blindly update your production. You need to test it uh, the way that developers do uh, testing for the application. So we'll introduce a continuous integration process to your infrastructure. So if you want to update some piece of your infrastructure, you will uh, submit a patch to your infrastructure as a code, and then run set of scripts, basically test this patch if it works. And if it is OK, then you'll merge your changes into a main master branch, and then it may be updated from that branch either manually or by clicking a button, either by clicking a button or uh, automatically updated uh, using webhooks. And GitOps is an approach which says that everything should be stored in Git, and you need to utilize uh, webhooks in order to uh, trigger required changes and start required tools to update your infrastructure. So now let's move to Q&A. Thank you, Oleg. We have a, a few questions from the audience now that uh, I can read off to you. The first one is, what is the base uh, 
for the Kubernetes clusters. I, I think I mean base OS for the Kubernetes clusters. Okay, so we, uh, Kube as a product supports uh, various operating systems. So we do support Red Hat Enterprise Linux, we do support uh, Ubuntu, and we, our upcoming release also have support for CC Enterprise Linux, and we also support variations like CentOS, uh, Debian, and basically any release, uh, any operating system which has support for the Docker itself. Okay, so anything that supports Docker can be supported and then they're obviously testing on the different versions and, and compatibility of version levels and stuff like that that you, you need to look at probably. Yes, yes, and we do uh, have a lot of t uh, internal testing uh, to verify that nothing breaks. Sure. Don't want anything to break. Is the, uh, is the logging solution uh, fully HA is the second question. So yes, uh, during platform creation, uh, user has an ability to customize uh, how many uh, masters and data nodes, uh, nodes he requires for his logging. And depending on his configuration, it, will, it may be configured as with HA in mind. Okay. Um, and then IPVS is implemented, implemented with the Kubernetes network provider, question so mark? Out of the box, we do support Virus uh, CNI plugins, um, CNI providers, and like Canal, Calico, Weave. And for IPVS, I believe it's uh, those uh, that are based on IP uh, virtual services. Uh, we do not support it out of the box, but you can install it on your own. Like for example, Kube Router based on BGP supports IPVS. Okay. What, I don't really, I'm not that familiar with IPVS myself. What's the, what's the main use case for that? Do you know, is it? Uh or multiple use cases? Okay, IPVS, it's just IP uh, virtual system, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. <laughs> and it uh, it is a basic start to build in uh, virtual uh, services and IP virtual so services, basically. So a, a it's a virtual networking technology. Yes. Cool. Yeah. All right. Does the solution allow you to administer Kubernetes masters and worker accounts plus SSH accesses? So for cloud environments, uh, when you create a cluster, you may specify SSH public keys that will provision on the machines so that later you can SS, uh, SSH into those machines for additional uh, things that you want to do. For on-prem installations, our main use case is installation using SSH. So basically, um, uh, you will be able to access those to your uh, machines using SSH. And yes, uh, our solution actually, you have full access over the infrastructure that is being created. So you have full access to all worker and master nodes. Yeah, which would be different probably than some of the, the uh, cloud provider solutions where you don't really get access to your master nodes. Yes, public cloud providers usually don't provide you any access to the master nodes at all. Okay. Um, the next question is how do you roll certs inside of a cluster? So when we do provision of a class, uh, cluster provisioning, uh, we have our custom agent which performs provision and we provide uh, agents, provide certificates uh, to that agent and we do have encryption in, in transit and within a cluster, uh, we, we, uh, on actual nodes it's stored in a secure manner so only root can access uh, those. Okay. Right, and I think the, the next question builds on uh, security saying, can you tell me more about security best practices? For example, how do you ensure that only approved pods are run on a cluster? So one of the uh, use solutions for that one um, would be to have an admission uh, controller uh, webhook that will validate if uh, image for the images used in the port are approved, basically uh, whitelisted. Mm -hmm. okay. How do you recommend doing backups and restoration? For backups and restoration, it all depends on your actual uh, cluster deployment. So if you use, uh, if you create cluster in a cloud, then it's better to use tools provided by your cloud provider. We, our product have support for AWS um, integrated. For Azure and Google Cloud, uh, we do not integrate yet, but Azure provides, uh, Azure provides several solutions to uh, backing up your infrastructure and restoration. Uh, for on-prem installations, uh, 
uh, we have a list of uh, folders that usually should be backed up and if you uh, there is also a Hepto solution called Valera uh, previously named as Arc which allows you to do uh, backup of your UTCD storage and it also tries to do snapshots of your uh, volumes but it's in early stages yet so probably custom development will be required to meet your actual requirements. Okay. And does Kubler have uh, a tool for isolated environment support? So as a product, we do support isolated environments. Uh, so we have uh, our installer allows you to provision um, Kubler platform in isolated environments and then create clusters uh, within that isolated environment but we do not have any external tool to share how to uh, prepare um, such kind of um, tools okay. for usage. So, so we, and obviously I know this, but we set up Kubler in isolated environments, and just in case of saying, is it a tool, uh, it's a little more complicated like that, and I think that's some of what you went through today in terms of you know, all of the different things you need to make sure are available in that isolated environment in, or, in order to be able to deploy Kubernetes, right? It's not just, uh, there's no, it's not easy, right? It's not one simple tool. Yeah, so we do have an internal tool that allows you to prepare your environment to support that one, basically to provide you all the images and binaries uh, was required. But if you would like to deploy any custom application uh, from the internet to your isolated environment, we don't have any tool that will simplify your life yet. Okay. And uh, which tools do you recommend for conformance testing? And here they say CIS benchmark. What is CIS benchmark, do you know? CIS benchmark is a benchmark which validates if you follow best practices for virus deployments. Mm -hmm. And in Kubernetes world, there are at least two benchmarks. One is for uh, benchmarking if you follow uh, Docker security best practices and mm -hmm. another is for Kubernetes security best practices. And there are commercial, commercial offerings um, on the market that will validate to you and there are a bunch of open source tools uh, which is just say, uh, called the same way like CIS benchmark so you can search on a GitHub for open source solutions. Okay. Well, great, Oleg. That's all the questions we had today. I want to thank everyone for joining today's meetups. Uh, feel free to reach out with questions or topic suggestions uh, at the email provided. Once the meetup ends, you'll be asked for feedback. Please share your thoughts, as this will help us to improve future meetings. We hope you can join us next time. Thank you.